Let's stand, please, everyone. Folks, I'm going to ask you to, if you do have to have a meeting on a Wednesday evening, try to arrange it so that at least you can finish by a quarter to seven. Probably, I'll probably say that again towards the end of the meeting. We're going to read Romans chapter 14 from verse 1, and then we'll stop at chapter 15, verse 3. We're exploring the subject of Christian liberty, and we are using Romans 14 from verse 1 to verse 3 of chapter 15 as our uh, base. So we want to read that passage again, and we'll read alternately. Have you found it? Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another.
It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. All right, you may be seated. In our previous lesson, lesson one, and uh, I probably just want to uh, say a word of greeting to persons who are maybe following on live stream. Sometimes we don't um, acknowledge you, uh, and I'm sorry for that. But um, the last time, this last time I was away, several persons came to me and told me that they listened to, they participate in the service every Wednesday. So I was thinking it's basically only on Sunday, but persons are telling me that uh, they are listening or they are participating in service uh, on a Wednesday. So greetings to you, and I do hope that our studies are being of a help to you. So we began in our previous lesson to study Romans 14 to 15.3 in an attempt to explore the subject of Christian liberty. And we did state that Christian liberty is a biblical alternative to legalism. And uh, as we go along, brethren, I, I'd like for you, for us rather, to just check ourselves very carefully because it could be that we are legalists without knowing that we were or knowing that we are. And we would not want to be legalists because Paul was very strong, adamant against persons who were legalists. And the truth is that legalists um, have very good intentions. Most of them have good intentions. We noted that Paul's letter to the Romans indicates that the church of Rome was experiencing a lot of contention between its Jewish and Gentile factions. So the church at Rome, the church at Rome, no, it wasn't just one assembly, several assemblies, but one church. What was happening was that there were several, the Jews were outnumbered the Gentiles in the church. And they were both pressuring each other. They wanted each other to conform to what they both felt was right. And uh, both of them were accusing each other from their point of view of not being spiritual enough. In chapter 14 of his letter, Paul addressed the matter of Jewish stroke Gentile in fightings in respect of the appropriateness of eating certain types of food and observing certain holy days. So in this church, this first century church, Paul had to be dealing with things like that. He had to be dealing. And can you imagine that the, the writer of the Hebrews, we don't know exactly who it was, 
a lot of people feel that it was Paul. Some believe it was Apollos, but there are other views too. In, in, in chapter 6 of the Hebrews, this writer said, leaving the principles of the doctrine, let us go on to perfection. And he was saying the principles of the doctrine, and he named it, he said, baptism, fundamental things. He said, we need to move on now from these things. So can you imagine Paul have to be dealing with days and whether you can eat meat or you mustn't eat meat. Can you imagine that? The writer to the Hebrews is saying, folks, we have laid a foundation. We have been filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. We have repented. Now we need to move on. That was bad, but to me, this is worse. Because Paul has to be saying, you can't be fighting over which day to, to, to hold us sacred and what food to eat. When will we ever... If we can't get past that, brethren, and this is, this is basically why I'm looking at these studies, you know. Because there's no way we can come to Christian maturity without considering these things. There's no way. It's not possible. It's not possible. And as I said last time, our study, our base information comes from a document prepared by an apostolic or some apostolics. But we have also looked very carefully at the my teaching tends to be in, I tend to do word studies. I look at verses. I take one verse at a time and try to pick it apart and try to get as much information as I can out of it and present it without being laborious and sometimes it's difficult not to do that. But also I've looked at several commentaries, views of different persons, some who are dead long ago, some who are still alive. The, the issue at hand was not the initial salvation of the saints. That, that the Jews weren't saying that the Gentiles were not saved. And the Gentiles were not saying that the Jews are not saved. Their ability or inability to participate in biblical, biblically acceptable behavior due to a strong or weak conscience. That was the problem. We observe that in introducing the matter of the exercise of Christian liberty, Paul made it clear to both the Jews and the Gentiles in the Roman church that love is the primary aspect of our walk with God. Love. And we said, we noted too, if you remember, that he commended the Roman church for their faith, but he never commended them for their love. Paul desired to show the Roman Christians that while there is room for personal conviction and opinion, there is no room for fighting over such matters in the body of Christ. So Paul is saying, of course, you can have your personal convictions and opinions. But you can't fight over that in the church. We stated that in Romans 14, 1 to 15, 3, Paul deals with the relations between the weak and the strong among the saints in the church at Rome. The strong saint, based on Paul's description, may be described as one who is mature and understands his spiritual liberty in Christ and is therefore not enslaved to diets or holy days. The weak saint may be described as one who does not fully appreciate what his Christianity means. In particular, he does not see that the individual who has received full New Testament salvation and has committed himself to Jesus Christ is emancipated from all law, all law, but that which is involved in his responsibility to Christ. He's really set free from all law, except the law of Christ. 
Did you know that, brethren? Were you aware of that? You weren't aware of that? I just sense a little, a little more, I more feel it that you, you, you weren't aware of that. You know that the Old Testament law has been abrogated completely. Yes. And that is why I don't threaten people with the law. I don't threaten people with the law. Many principles of the law are relevant to the church. Many principles. Many. Many. And are enunciated in the New Testament. But the Old Testament system, the old covenant law has been abrogated. And you remember that Paul said to the uh, Colossian church, I don't understand after you have been liberated from certain things. You are saying don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. And he said all these things perish with the using and they don't have no ability to make you any moral than you are already. I realize that we have a far way to go in terms of our understanding of grace. It's going to take some time. It's going to take time. But we have to deal with it, brethren. We have to learn it, eh? The weak saint is an immature believer who feels obligated to obey legalistic rules concerning what he eats and when he worships. The weak Christian does not understand that salvation is a faith from first to last. The conscience of such an individual is affected by concerns in regard to customs dating from pre-Christian days. It is clear that when Paul refers to the weak saints, he has the Jewish Christians in mind. And that's quite remarkable. One would have thought that it would have been the Gentile saints who were weak. But it wasn't so. The Gentile saints, it was the Jewish saints who were saying, we need to obey these instructions. The Gentile saints didn't have that problem. And, and brethren, I want to encourage you to read this passage of Romans for yourself. Because I want, it is very important that you are convinced that what we are teaching is Bible. If you can find that it is not Bible, then reject it. I'm telling you that up front. But if it is Bible and it goes against what you have believed, then you can't tear the pages out of the book. And you can't be vexed with pastor. You understand what I'm saying, folks? In our previous lesson, we looked at verses 1 through to 4. In this lesson, we will consider verses 5 through 19. So verses 5 and 6. King James reads like this. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he does not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. For he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not. And giveth God thanks. So Paul is virtually saying both of them are right. It's not a case that any is right or any is wrong. Do you think we have the capacity to come to that? Huh? New Living Translation says, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced 
that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day, do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food, do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. So brethren, these, these for instance, these dietary laws, it's not, for instance, like how Brother Peter and I um, relate. Brother Peter doesn't eat certain things for health reasons. It's not that he believes that he's more holy. These people now, they were not abstaining from meat for health reasons, you know. Their conscience told them that something was immoral about eating these meats. So they weren't, eat, they weren't refraining from eating pork because they felt that pork was unhealthy. They were refraining from eating it because they said, that pig is an unclean animal. We shouldn't touch it. Because you see, the Jews are remembering their laws. They can't, that is what they are having difficulty getting past. The old law system. Now the Gentiles never had that problem. Their, their, the, the only other problem some of the Gentiles would have would be meat offered to idols. So you see, brethren, a lot of this stuff has to come comes back to how we were cultured. Sister P, that's you there? My God. That is a Nicodemus business. These verses clearly indicate that there were differences of opinion in the church at Rome in respect of the observance of days and the eating of certain types of food. It is very important for us to note that Paul did not say that all the Christians should believe the same thing. He did not say that. Rather, he stressed that all the Christians should be fully convinced in their own minds. He didn't say, Paul didn't, for instance, give a rule to say, look, these meats are not to be eaten by anybody, full stop. You must not drink any wine at all. And these are the days you must worship. That would have been a neat way to solve it, don't you think? But Paul said, no, that's not what Christ has called us to. You be persuaded in your own mind. Are you out there? Okay. Whatever our persuasion is, this, listen to this, folks. It is important that we do what we are doing as unto the Lord. And we must be able to give him thanks in it. To do something simply because someone tells us it is right. Or to refrain from doing something simply because someone tells us it is wrong is dangerous. Because we may end up living our lives based upon someone else's ideas and beliefs and not our own. We must be persuaded in our own mind that we are living in a manner pleasing to God. It is not possible to live for God successfully without understanding why we live the way we do. There must be that, brethren. I must understand why. I must understand the principle 
Why? And so, I have known of this happening, that somebody who is deemed to be strong comes to somebody else and says to them, the Lord says you must get married to brother so-and-so. And because this person is weak and believes that this person is hearing from God, they do it. And chaos, hell, and powder house. A pastor, good friend of mine, he told me that in the church that he grew up in, you know, there was a, a lady in the church that um, was deemed to be very spiritual. So she went to a relative of his and said, Sister so-and-so, the Lord says you are to marry deacon so-and-so. And he said, the relative of his said before, so a backslide. <laughs> Folks, you must be persuaded in your own mind. Don't let anybody tell you to marry anybody. Know what you are doing. If somebody tells you they had a vision that you were to marry so-and-so, ask God to give you a confirming vision too. Because when the marriage is in trouble, you can't live off somebody else's vision. That's the danger of the person with a weak conscience. You know, they can be destroyed easily. And so, while Paul says that the strong must must, must help the weak. The weak must not be happy to stay weak. You must develop a strong conscience. You mustn't just say I'm weak. But we'll get further. We'll see how, how, how a strong conscience is developed. And it's developed in, in the same way that most other things are developed. So brethren... I must understand why I'm being asked to live this way. You can't just tell me that it is so. Give me a reason that is reasonable and scripturally sound. That's very, very important. Eventually, we will either let our beliefs go or we will fall into a legalistic understanding of holiness following a set of rules without understanding why. So we have to be careful. And you see, it is very important to be consistent. I have a good friend. He's a pastor. He pastors overseas. He told me that he did not allow his son to play basketball for his college because the rules of the organization that he was in said that uh, that should not be done. But then he said he went to a camp and saw kids of pastors shooting baskets and he said, you never learned that in your backyard. You play competitive basketball. And he had now to go to his own son, who was there seeing that and saying, son, I apologize to you. I really, you know, this is what. And, and it took a time for his son to recover. And folks, you know, if we're not careful sometimes, our children just wholesale, when they come to maturity and begin to probe these things for themselves, 
if we haven't given them a sound biblical answer, sometimes they just reject it, you know. Folks, I, I'm trying to plead with us, you know. Because I, 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 well. Paul informs us that what makes a dish of food or a day holy is the fact that we relate the food or the day to the Lord. That's the real important thing. The person who treats a special day as holy does so unto the Lord. The person who treats every day as sacred, he also does so unto the Lord. The Christian who eats meat gives thanks to the Lord. And the Christian who abstains from meat also abstains unto the Lord. To be fully persuaded or assured in his own mind means let every man see to it that he's really doing what he does for the Lord's sake. And not merely on the basis of some prejudice or fancy. If you are doing it, do it, do it for the Lord's sake. Make sure that your motives are right. Don't do it just to please me. Beliefs that are not thoroughly examined are not worth believing. Brethren, I believe this with all my heart. And I, I, I say this here and I say it abroad. We must not be afraid of the Bible. Just the raw, unadulterated word of God. Just the Bible. Don't be afraid of it. If what you and I believe is true, then we don't have to be afraid to search it from the scriptures. If it is true, if it is scripturally sound, this Bible will back it up. You try and, you try and investigate the oneness of God. Put it to the test. Forget about what you have been taught. And you just examine it for yourself. People come to me and ask me sometimes when I engage them, how am I to be saved? I tell them, read the book of Acts. And you come back and tell me how to be saved. Because it speaks for itself. I have no problem sending people to the Bible. Now, if what you believe can't be supported by the Bible, then you are in trouble. Because what are you standing on? What am I standing on? So don't be afraid of the Bible. I do get the feeling that some of us are afraid of the Bible all by itself. We believe the Bible needs help. I do get that feeling sometimes, you know, brethren. I may be wrong. It's a feeling, and I could be deceived, but I, I sometimes get that feeling. One must examine what they believe if they are ever going to be convinced that what they believe is correct. If we do not examine our present beliefs, how can we prevent ourselves from being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine? If we do not think through our personal stands on moral issues, how can we discern between true holiness and a false sense of righteousness? We have to know what is truth for ourselves. On the judgment day, God will hold us responsible for what we believed, not necessarily what we were told to believe. One way to determine if we are fully persuaded in our own minds concerning our moral choices is to imagine a situation in which we are being confronted about our beliefs by an unbeliever. What would we say when an unsaved person asks us why we live the way we do? Could we give them biblically sound and reasonable answers? If not, then we may be living our lives in blind obedience to unscriptural man-made rules rather than living our lives in true holiness to the Lord. If you have to say, but that's what them tell me at the church. 
then something is wrong. Each one of us needs to be fully persuaded in our own minds. But our persuasion does not mean that there is no other way. Just because I believe it should be so, it doesn't mean that that's the only way. You have some churches that believe that actual wine should be served at the communion service. Some churches believe that it should be grape juice. Now, would you split a church because of that? Would you, would you, now why would I go and tell another man that he's wrong to do that? Why would I do that? I can't do that. On what basis would I do that? What would I bring to support my view? Suppose I am leading a church that believes wine should be used. And another person is leading a church that believes that grape juice should be used. That shouldn't cause us not to have fellowship. I have watched as churches have had ruptions because, and I said it before, this person believes that feet washing should be first and then after should follow communion. The other person said, no, communion must come first and then feet washing. And they split. New organization form. They couldn't decide that it's, it's all right. Your assembly can do it that way. What is important is that all the ingredients come together. If, if, if what comes first or last, not really going to kill us. You understand that, brethren? You sure you understand that? You sure you understand that? So what we are to do is both have communion and foot washing. Isn't that important? It don't really matter when it happens. It's the principle of the thing. You sure you're understanding me? All right. The message of this passage shows that there may be other ways, but we must be sure that in our particular persuasion, we are pleasing God. That's what is important. Tell your neighbor, make sure that you are pleasing God in your own life. Tell somebody that. The danger of an unexamined moral system is that people will obey the rules without ever understanding why they are doing so and what the underlying principles behind the rules are. We must be careful to explain this to people. This is the principle behind the rule. If I were to say all the ladies of Pentecostal Tabernacle must wear a black hat to church, what I need to do now is explain what is the principle behind that. That will make it far more acceptable than just to say that. Don't you think so? If I gave you a principle which is reasonable, wouldn't it be easier for you to accept that you wear a black hat? Yeah, if I just say wear a black hat, you go and say, when that pastor gone back to smoking. They will never establish personal convictions for themselves, but will only follow other people's convictions. When this happens, a person fails to develop their own personal relationship with the Lord in respect of holiness. This is why I'm teaching these lessons in a folk, because I want us to develop our own personal convictions. 
I want us to be able to say the internet is not good for me. Brother Robert, he doesn't have a problem with it. He can go on the internet, but for me, I'm going to take a break because right now I can't handle it. But what we do is we try to say, well, this covers everybody. But is not everybody having the problem? So I am depriving Brother Robert of a legitimate right to get information to help him with his studies. And the only reason now why some things are, we do certain things is because now the schools require it. You have, to go, you have to use the internet. Now school say you have to do your research. So poor us. Paul says that the individual's judgment of a certain day is with reference to the Lord. You watching that, folks? This is a very critical point. What Paul is saying is that the person's measure of what that day stands for and his appropriate conduct in that day is conditioned by his estimation of the Lord Jesus and what is fitting with reference to him. This is important. This is, we're coming now as to how we can develop strong, a strong conscience and become mature. Thus, a Christian's viewpoint regarding anything and his estimation of that thing is controlled or conditioned by the measure in which he knows the Lord Jesus. In other words, the greater our knowledge of the Lord Jesus and the more intimate our relationship with him, the better we will be able to discern what he approves and disapproves. So basically what I'm saying, we need to know Jesus for ourselves. We need our own personal relationship with Jesus. The more you become intimate with Jesus, the more he can tell you what he likes for you and what he doesn't like. I don't want you to get married to this person. It's not that anything wrong with them, but just not for you. I don't want you to work here. I'm not saying nobody must work here, but you... And the more we get to know Jesus for ourselves, is the more we develop the ability to know these things. We going to come to that. And Sister Winsome, I want you to write down that question. And I want you to, brethren, after this, after these sessions, we're going to have... Uh, evening when you can just ask questions. We're going to have mics in each eye, but the question has to be about the study, do you know? We're not talking about baptism and the oneness that time. Paul's words in verse 14 clearly indicate that's why I said at the start, don't, don't listen. Remember I said it in the first listen. Don't listen with a mind that is prejudiced. Because wait until the study is finished. Because some of your questions will probably be answered. And that's why it's important for us to go verse by verse. To really see what Paul is saying. And as I say, you know, brethren, if, if, if what we are teaching is not the word, you can reject it. If it is the word, if it is the word, then we have a problem, eh? It, that is if, if what we believe is not in harmony with this. Well, let me ask you, brethren, how do you feel? If there is a clash between what you believe and what the word of God says. 
What are you going to lean to? Let me ask you that. If it does happen that that, that happens, what would you personally do? What, what would you do? That's something, eh? You know, I never thought of that before to ask. My own mind is made up about it, you know. I just, I just. Would you really go to the word? You, you really would? You, you think you would, brethren? You really think you would? Or are you just saying that now? Huh? Well, then this study shouldn't trouble you at all, you know. You, you should be rejoicing right now because we're dealing with the word. Listen to what we, 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 we're running ahead to verse 14 quickly. Paul says, I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Wow. The New International Version renders these words as follows. As one who is in the Lord Jesus. I know this because I am in the Lord Jesus. Before I was in the Lord Jesus, I was a Pharisee. But being in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. The Amplified Bible's rendering is as follows. I know and I'm convinced, persuaded, as one in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is forbidden as essentially unclean, defiled, and unholy in itself. Now, that is not an easy lesson for us to learn. You know why I know it's not easy for us to learn? Because it wasn't easy for Peter to learn. And Peter is the man with the keys. And when the Lord said, Pete, get up and eat the thing, Peter said, no, Lord. Peter tell the Lord, no, even though it's you telling me, no. Can you imagine that? How if the Lord told you personally to do something, would you tell him no? You wonder, eh? Peter said, not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And the Lord said, Pete, I cleanse it. But remember, Pete has his history to deal with. So, not, so, so Jesus has to do it three times for Pete to catch the vision of the thing. Three times for Peter to say, boy, the Lord cleanse it. So we, like so we come over now into church. For instance, it took me a good while to start eating pork, you know. It took me a good while. Because even though I was saved, and no, I know, I know mentally that nothing not wrong with the thing, you know. But just something, I couldn't eat it up for a long time. But thank God. Now, brethren, you laugh, and I'm glad you laugh. But maybe there are other things. Not just something like that, but maybe there are other things that we have carried with us, which really do have no sound basis, but we just have them. And, and not only have them, but others who don't share that view, we condemn them. That's where the danger is, you know, folks. What I really, what I'm trying to do, a big part of what I'm trying to do with these studies, you know, is to get us to look not, not, not with a view to change anything we are doing, but to look at our attitude towards others who are not like us. Remember, we looked in, in last week's lesson where the Lord 
through, Paul said, look, you can't judge another man's servant. God has received him. You can't judge him. God received him. That's a big thing, you know, folks. We sometimes pretend to be more righteous than God. I am so glad that the qualification for heaven is not left up to me. Because I would rule out some, and of course I would put myself in. You wouldn't leave out yourself. Oh, no. Paul's persuasion found its source in the Lord, not merely in the reasoning of his own mind. In principle, and this is clear if you read it, Paul sided with the strong saint. He had no concerns about meats or drinks or this. Paul was long past that. Paul said, man, an idol is nothing. We know that. You're talking about meat offered to idols. There's, no real, there's only one God. So if me see meat and you say it offered to idols, me can wax it because there's only one God. Which idol it was offered to? There's only one God. But he said, every man don't think like that. And there may be some things, brethren, that you can do in private, that you can't do in public. Did you know that? Yes. You think Paul was, when she had a nice piece of meat offered to idols, that woman don't sample it? Paul, in moving that, but now, if he was eating with a man who have a problem with it, Paul would say, no, I will order some of what he's eating so that we can be comfortable. But that man can't go home now to Paul's house and judge Paul by what he's eating. You're wrong if you do that. This is what Paul is trying to say here. Paul's, in verse 5 to 9, Paul seems to emphasize the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. The word Lord appears eight times in these verses. No Christian has the right to play God in another Christian's life. No Christian. Don't allow anybody to play God in your life. Don't allow anybody to make all your decisions for you. That's not right. That's not right. You can ask advice. You can seek counsel. You must. Well, not you must. You should. But in the end, don't have nobody that you allow to just make every decision for you. That's not the purpose of the body of Christ. We can and should pray for advise, counsel, and even admonish each other. But we cannot take the place of God in the lives of our brothers and sisters. That is not right. And I'm saying that unapologetically. The only God in the life of the Christian is God. Verses 7 to 9. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. The New Living Translation puts it this way. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord, both of the living and of the dead. Tell somebody, Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Tell them, he should be Lord of your life. Tell them, I shouldn't be the Lord of your life. 
and tell them, I'm certainly not going to make you the Lord of my life. The life of each individual saint belongs to God. We should therefore live our lives as unto him. Oh God. Brethren, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? We belong to God whether we are dead or alive. We are subject to and bound to the will of Christ. We must live for Jesus. Oh God, let us live for Jesus. Don't live for pastor. Don't live for Pentecostal tabernacle. Don't live for the apostolic movement. Live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. If you live for Jesus, you can never go wrong. And if you go wrong, you'll get right quick. Live for Jesus. Oh, live for Jesus. Focus on Jesus. You see the sign, focus on Jesus. Not on the pastor, not on the assembly, not on the organization, not on the movement, not on the good preachers. Focus on Jesus. Live for Jesus. Oh, I want to live for Jesus. Some years ago, a brother told me, came to me, a precious brother. He said, Pastor, the Lord is leading me to worship at another assembly. He said to me, what do you think about that? I said, who is leading you? Who you said leading you? You said the Lord. And I said to him, my brother, none of God's people are owned by me, nor by the assembly, nor by the organization. I said, I didn't die for you. My blood wasn't shed for you. You are not filled with the spirit of John Mark. For if you were, you would have lived very riotously every day. No. So I said, my brother, as long as the Lord is leading you, that is enough for me. Because suppose the Lord, you think I believe that the Lord could not lead people from this assembly to another assembly? You think I could ever believe that? Why not? Why couldn't he do that? Then how some churches would be starting in America and England, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. If people weren't led of the Lord to leave here. A lot of people that are right now making valuable contribution to this church were led here from other assemblies. They never got saved here. They spent most of their life in another assembly. And we are benefiting from them now. Suppose they didn't come here. So because somebody says, Pastor, the Lord is leading me to go to another assembly. Why should I view that person with suspicion? No. We mustn't do that, brethren. Because that person is answerable to God. They are answerable to Jesus who called them and saved them and died for them. Now suppose I persuade them to stay. And then know when they are confronted by the Lord on the day of judgment. He said, why you didn't go? Well, Pastor Bartlett told me that I shouldn't go. Oh, it's Pastor Bartlett you were serving. I see what you mean. I told you to go, but Pastor said so you mustn't go. Me? Me not playing God in nobody's life. I'm not doing that at all. Not even in my own family, I don't play God. No, sir. Well, you know, I couldn't play God with Miss Lees because. Mm -mm -mm. 
Yes, sir. And if any dinner tonight. Maybe I just have to go to some bread. Oh, I leave over some of my liberty to follow their own consciences in areas where the Bible is silent or unclear. Brethren, you, you understand that when we talk about this stuff here, we're not talking about things that the Bible speaks about, you know. You understand that? We're talking about things upon which the Bible is not clear. That's it. When Paul said every man must be persuaded in his own mind, you know, he wasn't saying you must be persuaded whether you must commit fornication or not, you know. You understand that? He wasn't saying, well, I, I, I feel like I could commit adultery, so my mind don't tell me that. No, 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 no! He's talking about things that the Bible does not cover. Like whether you should eat meat or not. Some standards and practices in our local churches are traditional, but they may not necessarily be scriptural. We don't like to deal with these things, brethren, but we just need to talk about them. There was a time in the history of the apostolic church when dedicated Christians were opposed to radio. And what was their saying? Satan was the prince of the power of the ear, and it's the ear we're broadcasting on the ear. Now you laugh now, but you wouldn't have been laughing in the 50s or earlier. You wouldn't have been laughing in the 20s and 30s. But that's just how it was. And it's not that those people were fool, fool either. That was their conviction. And they had a right to that conviction. And if today... You are convicted that you shouldn't listen to radio. You have a right to that conviction. Are you understanding me, folks? The only thing you cannot do is tell me that I must have that conviction too. Nobody can force you to listen to the radio if you don't want to. But you can't force anybody not to listen to the radio if they want to. You understand what I'm saying, folks? This really shouldn't be so difficult for us all the same, you know. Some people even make Bible translation a test of whether or not one is in the faith. The church is divided and weakened because Christians will not allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord of his church and his saints. And I tell people, wherever I go, I tell them that God is rescuing his church from the hands of men. I see it happening. God is trying to get back his church so that it is not our church. It has been our church for too long. Some people will tell you the only version of the Bible you must read is the King James Version. And right now, I have read scriptures that if I had just left it in the King James, you wouldn't understand a word that you read. You're not going to honestly say that to me. But it's the truth. And the Bible was meant to be read and understood it wasn't meant to, you know, my, I love the King James Version best of all, you know. Why? Because I love the poetry. I love the way the language sounds because I am, I am that way inclined. I love Shakespeare. I love whole English. I read the thing a lot. I was in the airport a couple of years ago laughing my head off. And a white lady came to me and said, what is so funny? I said to her, son, Shakespeare, me reading. I was reading one of Shakespeare comedies. She said, you still read that stuff? I said, yes, ma'am. I love the literature, so I love the King James Version. 
But I realize that a lot of God's people don't understand it. When I started to use the message Bible, one of our precious sisters said to me, and she's here tonight, but I'm not going to call her on it. She said to me, Pastor, we can get one of those message Bible. Because when, I, when you read it, everything clear. When you read the King James, you understand nothing sometimes. But the thing must be read to be understood. So, but, but folks, you have some apostolics that will tell you if you read any other Bible, you're outside of the will of God. And I have shown you in a previous study that when at the Council of Jerusalem, when James read from the scripture, he did not read from the Hebrew Bible. He read from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, to prove his point. So if it was only one version, you could read from James wrong then. Because one would have thought the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So if you're going to read it, Read the Hebrew. James went and read the Greek Old Testament. The Septuagint. To make his point. And the Septuagint said, put it in a way that was more clearly to the point. That's why the Holy Ghost made him use that. So here we are. Now imagine if we were to be fighting. I know that some folks are not happy that I read any other version than the King. I know that. But tough for you. I'm not going back because I want God's people to understand I can't cater for you. You don't like it, so I must let people be in darkness because you don't like it. No, folks, you have to straighten up and fly right. The church don't belong to you. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's God's church. Lift your hands and worship. Say, Pastor, you are right. An interesting illustration of this truth is given in John 21, 15 to 25. The truth is that the life of each individual saint belongs to God. That's the truth. Jesus had just concluded a conversation with Simon Peter by saying to him, follow me, verse 19. Peter began to follow Jesus, but then he turned around and saw John. Peter then asked Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Verse 21. Notice the Lord's reply to the inquisitive Peter. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. In other words, Peter, your duty is to ensure that you glorify me. Let me worry about John. The Lord said to Peter, this is how you're going to die. He told him by what that he should glorify God. So Peter now said, John, I want to know how, what happened to John. You tell me that I'm going to die that way. How John going to die? And the Lord said, if I choose that him don't die, none at all. That's my business. You follow me. Me tell you already, say, so you went dead. And Peter couldn't leave it alone. Because the Bible said from that time, there went forth a saying that John would not die. And John wrote and said, but the Lord did not say that he would not die. All the Lord said, if I will that it be so, that's none of your business. So now Jesus said that to Peter alone. So that rumor going abroad, who it could go abroad by? The other disciples never hear that. The Lord said, Peter, that is not your business. So now there went a rumor that John would not die. So where that rumor come from? You see that evening, the best of us there, some little crosses. Peter.
Peter spread that. And Jesus never said that. All Jesus said, Pete, John's, my purpose in John's life is not your business. You deal with your own life. I will deal with John. Oh my. Oh my. All right. Verses 10 to 13. And we're going to close with this. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. This is how the New Living Translation puts it. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So, let's stop condemning each other. In view of the fact that each believer lives and dies to God alone, Paul asked the saints why they were inclined to judge and condemn one another. Paul asked the wee Christian, why are you judging your brother? You see him doing things that you don't think is right. Why are you judging him? Then he asked the strong Christian, why are you despising your brother? Because he doesn't have, feel the liberty to do what you do. Why are you despising him? Remember that I told you, brethren, that some years ago, we had, I don't, well, it was, a, it was at our, one of our conv conventions that we had to, a, a, a resolution was tabled that had to do with the issue of television, whether ministers could own a television set. Prior to that resolution, no minister of the United Pentecostal Church was supposed to have had a television. I said was supposed to. If you know of any that had before, it wasn't supposed to. So, so that resolution came on the floor that day. And, 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 and one of the things, well, I made a contribution, and one of the things I said, because, brethren, I like to talk and make my views heard. I, I'm not one that... I, I believe that I must let my leaders and my brethren know how I feel. Because, you see, I go and, all of us go and talk outside of the meeting, you know. So might as well you talk inside. So that anything you say outside, you already say it inside. So it don't look no way. That's how I am. And my wife, my wife will tell you sometimes. But in that meeting, I said, brethren, this resolution is not saying that the ministers must go out and buy a TV, you know. All it is saying is that it is not a sin to own a TV. 
So if you feel a strong conviction that you should not have one, don't have it. And I said, I said, those of us who feel that we should have a TV, don't believe that those who say we should not are fools and behind the time. They have their personal conviction. And I said, those of us who believe that we should not have a TV, must not look at those who believe we should and say, them not so holy like me. See, that's how we tend to operate and that is dividing the body. It's not right. Your conviction is your conviction. We used to say, say I, will, I will set no evil thing before my eye. I said, so that's why you can't watch TV. But now people have TV and watch TBN all day. Pure gospel them. Well, some of the evil stuff is true. Or, uh, before I watch that, I, I would pre pre prefer to watch National Geographic or History Channel rather than watch some of what come on on TBN. But you see, brethren, you see, you see th things, have, things, have, things have a way of developing and what we have to do, we can't, we can't be, we can't, we cannot be against technology, you know. We have to be against the uses of technology. We can't be against technology. I have heard people fighting against technology. I have a microphone in their hand. And they have said the apostles were not concerned about technology. And they are able to be heard because they have a microphone in their hand. And in their church is an electronic keyboard. Then what, how that come about? In their, on their side of their belt is a cell phone. But they said the apostles were not concerned about technology. And they are right because they never have it. They use what technology was available to them. I believe if Paul was around, he would hit the radio and the TV hard. I believe so. I don't believe he would spend a lot of time watching it. But he would, he would preach on it. That's my conviction. You might think that is not so. And that is your conviction. So Paul is saying to the weak Christian, stop judging your brother. And he's saying to the strong Christian, stop. Stop despising your brother. It's not right. Do not despise people who don't see things the way you do. And don't judge them either. Don't do it, brethren. It's not right. Paul, this is the Bible we're talking about now, you know. Paul is saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Both the strong Christian and the weak one must stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And they will not judge each other. They will be judged by the Lord. How could someone judge another when the other is not under his authority but under the authority of Christ? Since every believer will give account of himself before the judgment seat of Christ, there is no reason for any believer to think that he can sit on a judgment seat and condemn his brother now. It is the Lord who bought the individual with the price of his blood. So it is the individual's responsibility to, to work out his salvation before God with fear and trembling. That's what Philippians 2, 13 to 14 says. It is the individual who will answer to God as to whether or not he presented his body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Paul utilized the term brother. Why are you judging your brother? Why are you condemning your brother to help the Romans to see that they would only be condemning their own family member, a member of their own body? You can't do that. Sometimes we tend to think that others should give an account of their walk with God to us. We feel the need to approve of their behavior and choices. If we do not approve of their behavior and choices, we conclude that they must be wrong and should therefore change their behavior 
to conform to our beliefs and opinions. Have you ever found yourself doing that? Nobody never do that in here yet, eh? Why? We're well saved, eh? I have done that sometimes. I, John Mark Bartlett, have done that. These verses teach us, however, that since it is Jesus Christ who will ultimately judge our practices, we have no right to judge others now. It is important for us to remember that when we are talking about scriptural prohibitions, that we are not talking about scriptural prohibitions such as drunkenness, adultery, lying, and malice. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about non-moral issues and gray areas which the Bible does not plainly address. While the church must be uncompromising, uncompromising, uncompromising in its stand against activities that are expressly forbidden by Scripture, it should not create additional rules and regulations and give them equal standing with God's law. Many times Christians base their moral judgments on opinion, personal dislikes, or cultural bias rather than on the word of God. When we do this, we may be demonstrating that our own faith is weak. We may think that God is not powerful enough to guide his children. Brethren, I don't mind telling you that since I have been the pastor of this assembly, I have seen some people get saved here. And I have said to myself, boy, when I hear their story, I said to myself, I wonder if these people can stay saved. I have said that. I have honestly said that. I've said it to them. I've said it to myself. And I think one or two of them, I've confessed it to them after a number of years. And you know why that was so? Because I didn't have a good understanding of the grace of God and the power of God. I didn't know how powerful God was as a keeper. But I realized that God saved them and he can keep them. If he couldn't keep them, they wouldn't even be saved in the first place. So when we say, boy, you have to do this or you have to do that, maybe we don't appreciate the power and the might and the love of God. The love of God. The question remains as to how we can determine what is moral and non-moral. Listen to this now, folks. This is interesting. We, we soon stop. This can be a relative concept to different individuals. Some people, for instance, believe that having a Christmas tree is wrong. Maybe some people in here believe that. Having a, you would never have a Christmas tree. And the belief is based off a misunderstanding of Jeremiah 10, verses 1 to 6. What does that say? Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workman with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, 
thou art great, and thy name is great in might. This passage is not referring to Christmas trees, but to the carving of an idol out of a tree and decorating it with gold in order to worship it. The vast majority of persons who install a Christmas tree in their homes in December are not worshiping the tree. Those who do not understand this often declare it as a sin to have a Christmas tree. The anti-Christmas tree group believes it is a moral issue, while the pro-Christmas tree group believes it is not. This parallels the examples that Paul uses of eating meats, drinking certain types of beverages, and observing certain days. To the weak saints, these were moral issues. But to those who had understanding, they were not. The two groups view the issue in two different ways. So it can be difficult to even determine what the moral and non-moral issues are. So now, what I think now if I, let us say for instance, that Sister Grandison puts up a Christmas tree in her home. I don't believe in Christmas tree. So I go to her home and see the Christmas tree. I say, idol you have in your home, you know. That's not right. Me can't stay here. Be gone. The blood is against you. I speak in tongues too. Under the anointing. Now, if I go to Sister Grandison's house and see a Christmas tree, that's not going to trouble me. I don't necessarily going to have a Christmas tree in my home. But that's not going to break up the fellowship between me and Sister Grandison. What I am con I'm interested in is that the Christmas cake that she have, have a, it's well seasoned with a little wine. And that, no, the ham is not my problem. The bacon and the roast chicken and the roast beef, if it tastes good, me do even see the Christmas tree. If it don't taste good now, might be missing the tree. <laughs> and get vexed and search through the tree. Why the food don't taste good. You understand? Brethren, that, those things mustn't break up fellowship between us. Have your own conviction, but that can't break up fellowship between us. And we mustn't misapply the scripture either to support our point of view. Finally tonight, as humans, we tend to believe that we are right and everyone who does not agree with us is wrong. Is that true? Would you say that is true, brethren? Huh? Is that right? Uh, so why we do it then? You remember the blind men and the elephant? Argue about an elephant that none of them has seen. Benjamin Franklin once used this illustration to show that nobody is necessarily 100% right in what they believe. He said... That when an individual is standing in a patch of fog, that individual can look all around them and see everybody in the distance surrounded by fog. When that individual looks at the perimeter around himself, it appears as though he's in the clear. In reality, he's just as much in the fog as those he views from a distance. It just depends on the perspective one is looking from. When another individual who is standing afar off looks at the one who thought he was in the clear, he appears to be in the fog also, and the other sees himself in the clear. You ever stand in fog yet? Do it one day and you will prove it. Go up to Newcastle.
The truth is that we are all in the fog to some extent. And if we had enough humility, we would acknowledge that. If every apostolic had enough humility, they would admit that. We are all in the fog to some extent. Nobody is right on everything. However, the fog is always more thick in some places than it is in others. We're going to stop there. We have a few more pages to go, but we'll stop there and pick up this lesson the next time we have Bible study and do part of lesson three, which we should close with that. Then we'll have a session where we allow you to ask questions. Let's stand. I want you to ask the person beside you. Ask them. Ask them this question. Are you afraid of investigating what you believe from the Bible? Ask that. Tell them you shouldn't be. Tell them if what you believe is right, the Bible will confirm. Tell them if what you believe is wrong, then you need to change. Because you see, brethren, we can't change the Bible. That is the alternative, you know. Is the Bible we would have to change. No one said the Bible wrong and we right. And some of us believe we know more than even God himself. But we don't know more than God. Last thing I wanted to tell the person beside you. Remember that it's God's church. All right, you may see. Listen carefully to the announcements. Ushers, while we are reading the announcement, can we just receive an offering from the people of God, please? Ushers, could you just pass around the baskets? You're listening, folks? Listening? Please rem be reminded of our men's and women's fellowship Labor Day project tomorrow, Thursday, May 23rd, beginning at 8.30 a.m. You listening? Ladies, you are being asked to take your dust rags, a soft washing brush, and if possible, a small bucket. Ladies, we want to see you, you know. A special outreach service led by Pentab will be held at the National Children's Home on Saturday, May 25th. Service begins at 5 p.m. We need altar workers, Sunday school and children's church teachers and helpers. Folks, look at me. Look at me, folks. Look at me. Look at me. You're looking at me? The Lord has opened a door for us at the National Children's Home. Sister, the Lord has given Sister Renee Taylor favor with the persons who run the institution. They are not even apostolic. They are of a different faith. But they believe that we can help them. And I, I don't believe this is a coincidence. I believe this is the work of God. Now, folks, that might not last for very long. So I'm going to encourage us to try and support these meetings. It's very, very important. With those, I, I, I have been speaking to Sister Renee and, um, it's amazing that for this, for this service, 
the lady who is in charge, she's not apostolic, as I said. She said she's going, she's, is going to be on fasting. Because she believes that the Lord is going to do something special. Can you imagine that? And I believe that the Lord wants to save that lady too. So I'm going to ask us to try 5.30. But we're meeting down here at 2.30. Just to pray and to get some instruction. Well, no, sorry. All junior choir members are being asked to meet here at 2.30. So all of us going to the National Children's Home. Wouldn't that be nice if all of us turn up there at 5 o'clock? Can you imagine what that would do? Eh? Children's crusade begins on Sunday. We want to remember that. A search is on for a new look for the Pentab High School's uniform. Please submit your ideas and designs to any member of the Pentab High School board no later than May 26th. There will be a finance committee meeting on Monday, May 27th at 6.30. Tickets are now available for sale for Project Hope's Tea Party, which is scheduled for Saturday, June 22nd at the Jamaica 4-H Club, 95 Old Hope Road. The cost is $2,500. Contact any member of the Project Hope Committee. Now the brother of Sister Josephine Haynes, Bruce Henry, suffered a massive heart attack and is on, life, on a life support machine overseas. Please remember to pray for him. Pray for Sister Haynes and the rest of the family. And if you could give her a call, brethren, that would be very good. Sister Ann Johnson has not been well. Let's remember to keep her in our prayers. All married couples, all married persons actually, who are desirous of ministering on the couple's choir, they are being asked to attend a rehearsal on Monday, May 27th at 6.30 p.m. In addition, all married persons are also asked to submit a wedding photo to any Agape Ministry Committee member or to brothers Orlando Garrick and Danny Williams no later than Thursday, June 4. Funeral service for the father of Sister Tiffany Forbes, that's Mr. Bailey, will be held at Pentecostal Tabernacle on Saturday, June 1, at 11 a.m. Brethren, <clears throat> our phone lines have been down for the past few days. They have been giving trouble for weeks, actually. So, I would like to sincerely apologize to all of you and all members of Pentecostal Tabernacle, and all persons who have been trying to contact us, and you have not been able to do so. It's really not our fault, but we understand your frustration. We are very sorry. We are trying to work on the problem, but it's just something that is proving very difficult for us, very frustrating. But we are doing our best to get our lines back up. And we do apologize for any inconvenience this might have caused you. Please forgive us, brethren. I know it is very frustrating. But it's frustrating for us who are on the inside that want to call too. We can't call. Can you imagine that? Only one line is working. So, brethren, I'm very sorry about that. But we are doing our best, and we ask you to see with us. All right? All right, brethren? 
Do you accept our apology? We mean it from our hearts. All right, let's stand. Now we are going to pray, brethren. Brethren, you listening? What did I just say? And then when we pray, we are going to go straight home. You listening to me? Absolutely no lingering. I didn't say this to you at the start, but I'm going to say it to you now. The community is under curfew, you know. But the police, we call them and they have been so kind to us to say, Pastor, have church. But tell the people to just go home as quickly as possible because we want to shut things down. You see, when it's good when you have favor with people. They didn't have to be so kind to us, you know. So we don't want any lingering brethren. Just greet each other and then go home. All right? Is that okay? Yes, with Sister Winsome, I hear it. Sister Winsome is asking if I hear that. <laughs> I might have to linger for a few minutes, but not long. Oh, my Sister Bartlett, don't look at me in that tone of voice. Thank you, Jesus. Folks, the month of May, remember I told you earlier that it would be very busy for me? You realize that I wasn't telling you a lie? And it, 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 the end is not yet. The end is not yet. But I realize that you are having greater services than when I'm, not here, than when I'm here, which I'm so happy for. We had a great time on Sunday, didn't we? I believe the Lord filled about 13 people with the Holy Ghost. So we give the Lord thanks for that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, you are good. And your mercies endure it forever. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us this evening. Lord Jesus, more than anything else, we want to have a relationship with you. We want to know you for ourselves. We want to become friends of God as Abraham was your friend. We want, Lord, to share intimate communion with you. Oh God, we want to know you in the power of your resurrection, in the fellowship of your sufferings, being made conformable unto your death. We want you to be able to whisper to us, to guide us personally, to direct us personally, to show us your will for our lives. To tell us where we must cut off. To tell us how we should proceed. Oh God, help us not to look down on any member of your body. Help us not to judge any member of your body. Because your very word tells us that we should not do that. Help us to pray past these prejudices, Lord, and recognize that your grace is sufficient for all of us. And it is your strong desire that every one of us should be saved. Oh God, bring us into that place where we can be united, even if we don't have uniformity, but we will have unity. Because you didn't make us all to be exactly the same. But you made us all to be partakers of your Holy Spirit. You made us all to be followers of you. And to be magnifiers of your name. And to run with the great commission. And see our world saved. 
Thank you for the people that uh, have been receiving the Holy Ghost recently, Lord. Thank you for this great outpouring. Help us, Lord, to nourish them and nurture them and admonish them and love them into discipleship. And help us, Lord, to be disciples ourselves. Lord God, gradually, in your beautiful way, sweeten our personalities. Take from us all the harshness, all the arrogance, all the pride, all the, the attitudes, God, that would make us be offensive. Gradually conform us into your image. Thank you for the offering that has been received. Thank you for blessing us, Lord, so that we can be a blessing. Take us home safely. Lord, let your spirit hover over this community tonight. Oh, God, push back the darkness. Help us to see that we have a responsibility to this community, to engage, to be kind to be friendly and to forward the mission of your church. And finally tonight, Lord, help us to remember the closing words of the prayer that we have called the Lord's Prayer. Thine is the kingdom, not ours. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. And thine is the glory forever and ever. Help us to take none of it for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, bless your brethren. Greet each other quickly. And uh,